the Holy Gospel, according to John, the 13th chapter. When he had gone out, Judas, that is, Jesus said to the rest of the disciples on the night of the Last Supper, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give to you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, so you also ought to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated and let us open with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today, we hear about Peter. Peter having to give account. He has to give account for his actions because he has broken the rules. You see, in his community, there are rules about clean and unclean. There are rules about being circumcised and being the uncircumcised. The Torah law that he and his fellow Christ-following Jews adhered to and, and tried to remind their brothers and sisters in the Jewish community that they still adhered to the Torah law commanded them that there were some things that they could eat and some things they could not eat. And there were people who were on the inside, the covenant community of God, the Israelites, and there were those on the outside called Gentiles. And this helped them know who they were before God, and it helped them stay united as a people, especially when they were scattered around the world in what you call the diaspora, the dispersion. Especially when they were oppressed by one foreign ruler after another, this identity helped hold them together, helped keep them strong. And then... Peter has the audacity to go in to the home of Cornelius, a Gentile, a Roman centurion, a representative of the oppressor. He broke outside of their rules and he ate with them, presumably ate unclean food. In addition to that, he had the audacity to go and actually baptize these unclean foreign representatives of the oppressor. He baptized them. In the Christ-following Jewish community, the early Christ-following community, baptism was a mark again, kind of like circumcision was for their Jewish culture, for their Christ-following culture, what we call the Christian culture, baptism was our mark. And it was the mark to mark our relationship with God, this covenant of love that we're in. It was also a mark to mark our relationship with each other, our unity with one another. And he had the audacity to go outside of the boundaries and the borders and to go to those who were not part of the community and to baptize them. And Peter had only one defense for what his actions were. He had to talk to them 
and witness to them about two experiences that he had. He had an experience with the living God. He had a vision where God set down before him a bed sheet full of animals, slithering, slinking animals, crawlers, four-footed animals, all sorts of unclean animals. And God said to him, get up and eat. And Peter said, no, Lord, nothing profane, nothing common or unclean, unholy has ever entered my mouth. And what does God say to him? What does God say to him? Nothing God has made is unclean. Do not call unclean that which I have made, God said. We make these rules about clean and unclean. But God created them. God created them and called them good. And suddenly, then, when three people come from Cornelius to ask Peter to come, he realizes that this isn't just about food. This is much more than that. This is about designating certain people as clean and unclean. Certain people as holy, as, as people and representatives of God's grace in the world. And certain people as unclean, unholy, impure. And so Peter goes. And then he has to tell his, the, the leaders of his community in Jerusalem not just his experience with God, but he tells them what he found when he got there. He says, God told me to go, so I went. And then, and then I went and I met these people. And I talked with these people. And I shared the word of God with these people. And I heard about their experiences. And I heard Cornelius tell me that he had had a vision from God who told him to send for the teacher Pre and preacher Peter and so we did this unclean Roman centurion heard God's word too God was already interacting with him already a part of his life already working in and through him bringing his whole community and his family into his home so that Peter didn't have an audience of one he had a huge audience in this home and then Peter notices that not only is God speaking to this Roman centurion, but the Holy Spirit of God has already rested itself upon these people in this home. These people who he was told to keep his distance from because they're unclean. So Peter breaks another boundary and he says, well, if the Holy Spirit's already upon you, then let's just recognize what God is doing and let's go ahead and baptize you. Because it turns out that you are already marked in relationship with God through Christ. Turns out that you are already part of this community because this community is so much bigger than our boundaries would let it be. What do you think about that? What does that tell us about today? How often do we want to put borders and boundaries around who's in, who's out, who's clean, who's not clean? How many divisions can we as a people create? We can create a lot, right? What kinds of divisions do you see in the world? Let's name them. Come on. Immigrants, immigrants, your immigration status. What was that, Pep? Gender. gender. Gender, gender identity, gender orientation, all sorts of gender related things. Age. Age, very good. Race, Race. very good. Religion. Religion, let's name that. Financial status, Financial status. very good. What? Housing. Housing status, amen, sister. What else? What? Politics, thank you. I was thinking that one too. 
<laughs> I mean, we can make a division out of almost anything as humans, can't we? I think it makes us feel safe. Right? It makes us feel like we know the rules in this tiny little group. So if we can stay in this tiny little group, maybe we can stay safe and we can pretend that we're all good. And, then, and when we feel unsafe, we can have others to blame. Right? So that kind of helps because then we can kind of cast all the blame upon them and we don't have to worry about ourselves so much. There's a hundred different reasons why we would be prone to giving in to these divisions. In the United States, one of our really big examples that we have is indeed racism, right? How do we know? How do we know that it even exists? Because it's a part of the water that we, we swim in. It's almost hard to see. Have you noticed that it's almost hard to see? There are things happening that many of us don't even see. We don't even recognize because it's not part of our world. It's, we've kept it at a distance. It's there in our world, but we've kept it at a distance, haven't we? So how do we come to know and to observe the world differently? How does our perspective grow and change? What can we do? Think about Peter. What did Peter do? He went and he met those people. Those people on the outside, right? He went outside of his comfort zone because he felt God calling him to, and he listened to their stories. So that when we sit down with a lady that I know whose partner is African American, and she says to me, every day in Clark County, my partner is almost run off the road because she is a woman who is black. I said, are you sure it's because she's black? And she said, yes. We're very sure it's because she's black in Clark County. And then we read books like uh, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, who's a lawyer in Alabama. And he talks about the, the, um, the, representa the disrepre disproportionate representation of people, especially men, who are black in our jails and our prison system. And he has some crazy is some remarkable statistics to share about that and then uh, we read books like uh, our book study is about to start the book evicted and we hear from someone who studied Milwaukee and talked with people who um, who ate different families and landlords who are involved in eviction after eviction in our country and how we have people who are are some of our brothers and sisters who are black living in um, these ghetto, unsafe types of areas where their landlords are evicting them one time after another, after another, after another. It's a systemic wide problem. But we don't understand about the system we live in if we don't bother to listen to the stories, right? The stories can be hard to listen to because it can feel like there's nothing we could do about it, right? It can just make us feel bad. But what happens when we listen to the stories? What happened to Peter when he listened to the stories? He acted, right? So maybe it makes us feel quote unquote bad, but it actually puts, but it also puts a fire in our belly. Hey, maybe we could call that fire the Holy Spirit latches itself into us and it burns us up and it makes us compelled to speak so that when the leaders, like the leaders in Jerusalem, call Peter to account, we have the courage to stand up and speak. If I may share, um, on uh, Wednesday, I think it was, Tuesday? Yes, Tuesday but Wednesday. On Wednesday, Danny Scott, uh, the leader of Faith Partners for Housing, our affordable housing coalition, he got a cake to honor two of our members who had um, the courage to go to our county council in the last couple months and to speak out about how affordable housing is a problem in this community because there's not enough of it and how we need to act now. And one of those members of our organization, of our affordable housing coalition, who did this on last Tuesday actually, was our very own Dorothy Clout. Dorothy, can you raise your hand? Yes. 
And so we give thanks for Dorothy for representing this faith family, for speaking out. Because speaking out and advocacy is really important, but it starts with knowing the people. Earlier this week, I was sitting down with a gentleman, and we were talking about, he said, well, I know, Pastor, that you're very passionate about people first language. And I said, well, yes, I am. And he said, why are you so passionate about people first language? And so I had to explain that as a child growing up, I grew up with a mother who's a social worker working with people with developmental disabilities. And she would always tell me that people are not disabled people. They're not defined by that one aspect of themselves. They're always people first. And she would tell me, you know what, Adrian? Language matters. And if you don't change your language, subconsciously, your values aren't going to change. Your language helps formulate your values as much as they reflect your values. And so she would say to me, always use people first. And so you might notice when I talk about, you know, working with people who are homeless or working with people with mental health issues or, or something like that, that we always try to put people first. It's one thing that we can do to do what Peter did, which is recognize the face. Because, you know, if we just talk about an issue, racism, prejudice, um, homophobism, did I get that right? I don't know why that didn't come out. Um, sexism. If we talk about an issue, it may not mean much to us. It may not say much to us. Unless and until we recognize the face standing before us and we can share the stories of the people who these forms of injustice affect. And so my hope and my prayer for us as individuals and as a faith community is that we have the courage to go outside of the boundaries and to listen to people's stories. And that we feel the Spirit of God calling us to go out and give account for walking across those boundaries. And that we together can find ways to demand change to walk alongside people and not speak for people, but as my mother taught me, to speak with people. And so I ask you, what boundary is God calling you? Is the Holy Spirit of God calling you to cross? What boundary is in your heart, in your mind, in your life, that you're feeling God challenging you to cross? Who is God calling you to listen to? What is God calling you to say, to share with others, to, with leaders, to give account for crossing these boundaries? Because when Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another, he might be speaking to his disciples but as we see in his life, he meant everyone. And so let us, let us follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us cross boundaries of boldness. How can we as a community help one another to be faithful to that call? Amen.